Muslim Brotherhood in the White House. I said they were a radical organization that wants to destroy Israel and establish a global caliphate. Well, let's put a final nail in that coffin. Let's just, let's just settle this dispute once and for all. And again, I'm not going to make the argument. I'm just going to use their own words. I'm going to show you something that happened at a political rally for the guy from the Muslim Brotherhood that is running for president of Egypt. He had a guy speak right before, I think, it, I think it was before him, a popular Egyptian imam. He's also a TV preacher, and he, he spoke to the supporters of the candidate from president from the Muslim Brotherhood who was standing on stage and nodding in agreement. Remember, this is a largely secular group that means no harm to Israel, our biggest ally in the Middle East. You see if that still works for you and the president. Watch this. حلم الخلافة الإسلامية حلم أرض الخلافة يتحقق بإذن الله على يد الدكتور محمد مرسي ومن معه من إخوانه وجماعته وحزبه رأينا الحلم الكبير الذي نحلم به جميعا الولايات المتحدة العربية الولايات المتحدة العربية ستعود يكون عاصمة الخلافة ستكون عاصمة الولايات المتحدة العربية هي القدس إن شاء الله تكون عاصمتنا ليست القاهرة ولا مكة ولا المدينة وإنما القدس إن شاء الله وسيكون هتافنا عالقدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين 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 ولن نواري ولن نداهن نعم هدفنا القدس سنصلي في القدس أو ننال الشهادة على أعتاب القدس الله على القدس رايحين شهداء بالملايين Do you think that's important at all for anybody to even show that on national television? Did you notice the fist? A global caliphate is coming. And they want to headquarter it in Jerusalem. So let me get this straight. The left wants to silence anyone who warns Jews that old hatreds are rising again, except at the same time they're dumping miracle grow and all the seeds of anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic hatred in the region and in Europe and here. They dismiss anyone who says the seeds could and now have sprout Nazis or communists. Both groups kill Jews by the millions. Then when somebody says the Muslim Brotherhood is not secular, look at the name, they dismiss them. And they follow Alinsky's advice. Same advice, in fact, the advice that was given to Saul Alinsky by Al Capone's killers, his hitmen, and used by Joseph Stalin. You isolate and marginalize. And if that doesn't work, Joseph Stalin decided, yeah, then you kill. It worked for Capone and Lenin and Mao and Stalin and Che and Pol Pot and Mussolini and Hitler, but I think you get the point. At the same time, the administration is marginalizing and isolating. No one notices that this administration and this president is appointing members of the Muslim Brotherhood into his administration. Arif Ali Khan, former Department of Homeland Security Assistant Secretary for Policy Development, Muslim Brotherhood. Mohammed El Bari, Homeland Security Advisory Committee member, Muslim Brotherhood. Rashad Hassan, he's a State Department Special Envoy to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, Muslim Brotherhood. Ibu Patel, Obama Administration Advisory Council on Faith-Based Neighborhood Partnerships, all part of a group that wants to establish a caliphate in Jerusalem called the Muslim Brotherhood. America, America, America. Ponder where we are. Which is more dangerous for the Jews and for all of humanity? Which one is going to lead to peace and prosperity? Going down a path that the world has gone down time and again, 
and hoping for change? When that change is never identified, it never ends well. Here's what I recommend. You instead, instead of hoping for change, you pray for the protection of divine providence and then get off your knees and get ready. The Nazi and communist parties are gaining power elsewhere in the world. And it will come here. The Islamists are gaining power. And they are already here. And the global caliphate is coming. على المسلمين أن يقاتلوا أهل الكتاب حتى يجبروهم على دفع الجزية جميع أهل الكتاب في جميع أنحاء الأرض القتال القتال هو ابتداء لإزالة الحواجز المادية وهذا قتال للدول وليس قتال للأفغان فنحن عندما نعلن الجهاد على ألمانيا مثلا على الدولة إذا عفضت أن تقبل أن يدخل الإسلام إلى أهل ألمانيا فنحن نخيعهم بين الإسلام أو الجزية والخضوع لأحكام الإسلام والجزية هي الضعيبة الوحيدة التي يدفعها غير المسلمين بينما المسلمون يدفعوا الزكاة ويدفعوا الخراج ويدفعوا الركاب ويدفعوا الضرائب إذا نقص في بيت المال ولم يكن هناك مال للجند أو هل للجيش هل تلوم الطرف الآخر أن يخشاكم يا شيخ أحمد يعني هل تلوم الأوروبيين أن يخشوكم حين تقولون إن علينا أن نقاتلهم جميعا نقاتل الدولة نقاتل الجيوش لا نقاتل الناس أنا نقاتل الدولة أنا عشان أخذ من فاتح الخطار هل تلومون هل الناس الناس لا نقاتلهم لا نقتلهم فقط إذا أصرت هذه الدولة أن تمنع نشر الإسلام في أراضيها فنقاتل الدولة كدولة يعني كتاب Clash of Civilizations لسامويل هانتنكتون واللي قبله لفوكوياما أستاذه الذي تنبأ بأن الاقتراع القادم بين الإسلام والغرب يا دكتور نعم صحيح صحيح يعني معناته نعم صحيح صحيح, صحيح, صحيح هم استعمرونا وهم كذا والإسلام لولا الجهاد لما وصل إلينا ولولا الجهاد لما وصل إلى باقي البقاء أغلب العالم القديم خلال ربع قرن كان وصل الإسلام بالجهاد والناس العاديين بدهم الإسلام اللي ما بده الإسلام ضل على دينه نحن في بلاد الشام أغلب أجدادنا الأوائل كانوا ليسوا مسلمين لكن دخلوا لحسن الإسلام ولعدالة الإسلام وبقي القلة القليلة في بلاد المسلمين رائع رائع لا لا وحفظنا لهم جوهرية رائع رائع إذا نحن مأمرون بالقتال لنشر دين الله نعم هذه طريقة الإسلام في نشر الإسلام طيب لو وصلتم أنتم إلى الحكم هل ستحررون فلسطين؟ نعم 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 يجب إعلان الجهاد ويجب إزالة إسرائيل من الوجود وإثنائها هذه هذا الكيان مسخ ويجب إزالته من الوجود هل هل ستوافق على أن يتولى مسيحي وزارة المالية مثلا؟ لا لا أوافق فيش وزارات أصلا في الإسلام ما في وزارات ماذا هنا؟ الوزير في وزير تفويض في في وزارة تنفيذ وزير التفويض يعتبر من الحكم والحكم خاص بالمسلمين فقط كل ما هو من شأن الحكم يعني رئيس الدولة عفوا رئيس الدولة اللي هو الخليفة أو معاون التفويض أو معاون التنفيذ أو الوالي أو العامل اللي هو زي بشبه المحافظ هذا يجب أن يكون مسلما ويجب أن يكون رجلا أيضا المستقبل هو للإسلام وسوف والخلافة الإسلامية قادمة تحقيقا لبشر رسولنا صلى الله عليه وسلم ثم تكون خلافة على نهاج النبوة Now, Al-Qaeda has as one of its clearly stated goals the re-establishment of a caliphate So, let's get this right We're going to go back over here to this map for just a brief second that we've now scribbled all over We're going to continue to do so I think that's what the purpose of chalkboards are for so in other words, a caliphate is a movement, a global movement of all the nations of Islam or Muslims to form a nation of Islam. Almost like a, uh, how we're the United States, they're going to be the United States of Islam, so to speak. So we see that Tunisia has had uprisings. We've seen uprisings in Libya. We now have the uprisings in Egypt. We now have problems going on in Israel and Syria and everywhere else. Um, Iran, they're all joining together under one flag, the flag of Islam. And so what happens is it's this global movement. The caliphate, my friends, has begun.
O officers of Pakistan's armed forces, you must seize the traitor rulers and end their support of the Ummah's enemies. He's the highest serving army officer to be arrested in a decade. The group he's allegedly linked to is Hizb Takhrir. That group's banned in Pakistan. Its primary goal is to establish an Islamic caliphate across the Muslim world. It says it doesn't advocate violence, but it wants to overthrow Muslim governments. Democracy? We have Pakistan and Bangladesh? Is anybody proud of the government of Pakistan and Bangladesh? Anybody here? The Muslims in Afghanistan desire to live under their Islam. They desire a system, a model of governance that represents their beliefs and their underlying values. The West can continue to reject and place its head in the sand and by extension and by default continue digging its own grave. And this Ummah has overcome the Mongols and the Crusaders of the past and now the Crusaders of the present. This Ummah is still standing after the collapse of communism. And this Ummah will continue to stand after the collapse of capitalism. There is one struggle. There is one struggle. There is one struggle. Here and there, it's one struggle. It's a struggle against the return of Islam. The return of Islam. The manifestation of Islam. In its entirety. This is why it is so significant that we understand the attacks as a whole, appreciate the context in which they occur, a broader clash of ideologies, clash of ideologies. produced video promoting a recent conference calls on people to be part of the revival, the fall of capitalism and rise of Islam. You are the descendants of Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi who refused to smile until an Aqsa was liberated. <laughs> The call for an Islamic state. His put to hear an Islamic group with members here in Australia attracted around a thousand delegates over the weekend. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says إنما المؤمنون إخوة Verily the believers about a single brotherhood The time of Khilafah is coming and they know that We know and they know They cannot stop it No one can stop Qadr Allah No one Whatever they do Islam is coming Islam is coming Islamic group Hezbo Tahrir held a conference titled One Nation, One State and One Flag calling all Yemenis to join in the greenstone of establishing an Islamic state which they say will unite all Muslims under the authority of Islam. Life's journey Our members of Hezb al-Tahrir, an Islamic group that was banned in Lebanon until 2006, a year after the Syrian army pulled out. This life is a bridge, don't build upon it, but cross over it.
judgment. We are gathered here in Copenhagen. This is not only my message, this is the message of a nation of more than 1.5 billion Muslims. So that this ummah starts with a new call. The call for the Khilafah, the call for Tawheed, the call for unity. And that is the only way forward for the Muslim world. Do we want that democracy? No! Do we want Islam and the Sharia? Do we want the Khilafah and the state? No! Yeah! Be Allah! To make the Muqdis, to the land of the Isra'u and Ma'raj, we're going to march as martyrs in our millions. Martyrs in our millions. Palestine! is Islamic land and will forever remain Islamic land. Soal perlunya khilafah atau pemimpin bagi umat Islam untuk mengatasi berbagai permasalahan seperti korupsi dan ketidakadilan. Our belief is one, our sentiments are one, our vision is one, and our brotherhood is one. That's the struggle. Wherever a Muslim is, A country surrounded by devastating threats on every side. End time prophecy is rapidly unfolding before our very eyes. Chief Chris Mitchell is here to discuss how history's final chapters will be written in Israel, in Jerusalem. Now, I want to go back to all the changes that have been taking place. Syria, Egypt, Turkey, of course, it's going on in Iran right exactly, now. Exactly, right. How do you see all this tying into prophecy, the whole rearrangement of the Middle East? Well, for, the, for years, decades actually, the Middle East had been sort of uh, dominated by these autocratic regimes like Mubarak, Gaddafi in Libya, Mubarak was in Egypt, uh, Assad in Syria, and they sort of, exactly, they, had, they sort of suppressed what was percolating underneath, which was this radical Islamist. And uh, so radical Islam through the Arab Spring has sort of come to the surface. It came to the surface in Egypt, it has in Libya, it did in Tunisia, and now in Syria. And I think what, what it, how it ties in prophetically perhaps, it's almost like the echoes of Zechariah are, are reverberating throughout the Middle East right now. You know, he said that one day the nations would gather around the country of Israel. And you can see that sort of unfolding as time goes on. Hello and welcome to A Spirit of Debate. I'm Lauren Green. Well, the Arab Spring up uprisings in Syria, Lebanon, and Egypt. Does the Bible have anything to say about these events? 
2,000 years ago, all roads led to Rome. Today, all roads seem to lead to Jerusalem. It is the most disputed and fought over piece of land in the history of mankind. And today, the Middle East is a region is a hotbed of political and religious conflicts that belie its relatively small geographical size. Which brings up the question, will history's final chapter be written in Jerusalem? Some attempts to connect the dots between what's unfolding today in the news and the biblical narrative. Chris Mitchell is the Jerusalem Bureau Chief for Christian Broadcast News. He joins me now from Jerusalem. Hey, Chris. It's great to be with you, Lauren. It's great. You know, as I'm talking about the biblical prophecies, a lot's been written the last few days, the last couple of weeks about biblical prophecy, especially the, uh, the verses in Isaiah that talks about Damascus. Um, mm -hmm. Explain how your book is really kind of different. Well, it's different in this way, Lauren. It sort of connects many of the trends that are happening in the Middle East right now. Uh, to give you an example, one of the trends that are happening is that in Islam, many Islamic factions are looking to Jerusalem as the capital of a future caliphate. Uh, also, Jews, I mean, for the last hundred years or so, they've been coming back to Israel and back to their capital, Jerusalem. And as well, many Christians recently have really become, have a passionate love for Jerusalem. And in unprecedented numbers, uh, Christians are praying for the peace of Jerusalem like never before. So if you take so to Syrian rebels in Syria who want to make Jerusalem a caliphate, if you take Jews living in Judea and Samaria, Christians coming to pray for the peace of Jerusalem, these are sort of threads that are weaving a tapestry that makes history, uh, you know, point back to here, to the city of Jerusalem. What does the tap tapestry look like? What, is, what are we seeing in terms of the biblical prophecy? Well, I think, I think it's sort of Jerusalem's becoming the convergence of uh, the crossroads sort of of history and prophecy. And we're, we're increasingly, as you said in the introduction, you know, uh, 2,000 years ago, all roads led to Rome. Now they are seemingly leading to Jerusalem. And so if you look at the biblical trends, for example, Aliyah, which is a Jewish word that means coming back to Israel. About 150 years ago, this place, Jerusalem, was a backwater. Mark Twain in the 1800s and late, late 1800s called it lifeless and dreary. But now it's a vibrant city and it's sort of uh, history sort of awoke a slumbering uh, Jerusalem. And now it becomes many times the source of contention. As you said, it's one of the most controversial places in the world. And uh, just a couple of years ago, I remember when Vice President Joe Biden was here and during his visit, there was an announcement that there were going to be apartments built in Jerusalem. It became an international crisis. That's just one example of what Jerusalem sort of is uh, the focus of world attention. It's, and uh, increasingly, the focus seems to be on the city. Well, uh, specifically, though, what does the Bible say about Jerusalem in terms of the, its narrative, um, you know, narrative of redemption, um, which is the, what the Bible's all about? But what does it have to do with Jerusalem? And how do the events of today fall in line with that? Well, Zechariah the prophet says in both chapter 12 and chapter 14 that, that uh, it would become a burdensome stone, and, uh, and we see that happening. And all nations would eventually come to this city. Uh, you know, we just uh, we were listening to Fox News just a few minutes ago and about this, uh, this rapprochement with uh, Hassan Rouhani, the uh, new president of Iran. But if you look at Iran, I mean, in many places, they want to see Jerusalem as the capital of a future caliphate. Uh, sometimes what people are hearing in the news, they know what's happening, but sometimes they don't know exactly what. And uh, in Jerusalem, as the Bible says, one day that the word of the Lord will be coming out of Jerusalem. And it says in Zechariah again that one day that the streets of Jerusalem, there'll be children laughing and playing. And if you come to Jerusalem today, you'll see that being fulfilled. And, uh, and many see, you know, eventually that what's happening here is, the, is sort of the emergence of a new kingdom and a new king. Uh, you know, the Bible eventually talks about the return of the Lord, Jesus Christ coming back here. And so that's what many people see, this mm -hmm. convergence of coming back, setting the stage. But there, is a, there are conflicts going on there. And one of the things that uh, a lot of people ask me about is Mecca. Why is it Jerusalem seems to be the focus of Muslims and not Mecca? Why isn't Mecca the capital of a caliphate instead of Jerusalem? That's a good question. Uh, just before when Mohammed Morsi, the uh, Egyptian president, was uh, running for office, one of the speakers at one of his rallies said that the, uh, the capital of the caliphate would not be Mecca, Medina, or Cairo, but it would be Jerusalem. I think part of that is that they want to supplant what, uh, what the Jews are doing. It's uh, many times here, this is a religious conflict, it's a spiritual conflict, 
and they want to supplant what Israel is doing, and they basically want to eradicate Israel. So I think the focus in many ways uh, for whether it's Syrian rebels, whether it's uh, Egyptian Muslim Brotherhood, or, or those uh, Al-Qaeda elements, they want to see Jerusalem as the, as the capital of a future caliphate. And it both goes in both Sunni and Shiite Islam, this uh, desire to make Jerusalem. It's a good question. I mean, Mecca is, uh, is sort of their spiritual capital, but eventually I think they want to see Jerusalem as the capital of what's a capi uh, this caliphate or Islamic empire. Well, let's connect the dots, though, because we've got a lot of talk about Syria today. But this is actually very much connected, you're, you're saying, to what the Arab Spring happened in Egypt, in Lebanon, um, and all the uprisings that we're seeing in the Middle East of uh, these um, Islamic countries that, on the surface, want democracy. But you're saying there's a, there's a, there's a connection here. Yeah, I think uh, you mean a connection between democracy and exactly. uh, what's the happening in the Arab and Spring. The idea that the Arab Spring and what they're fighting for, and all of these uprisings have to do uh, with primarily some of the same things, right? They want the same things. Yeah, well, when we were in Egypt a couple of years ago during the Egyptian revolution in Tahrir Square, just before Mubarak was overthrown, there was a sentiment in many of the uh, Egyptians that we talked to that they wanted democracy, they wanted freedom, they wanted more, uh, uh, better economy, better education. But I think that was supplanted by the Muslim Brotherhood when they came in and they took over for at least a year. Uh, I think that's the dream of many uh, people in the Middle East, but I think uh, it's being supplanted. Uh, one example of that is in Turkey and Erdogan and I think it's a largely untold story in the West is that uh, Erdogan has been in power for over 10 years right now and he made the statement that democracy is like a streetcar and then when you get off it you get off it when you want to take uh, the, that particular stop I think so sometimes democracy is being used as a tool by some Islamists to implement democracy but uh, but then take over and I think that's what's happening in uh, in Turkey there's also the statement that says you know one man one vote one time so they could use democracy as a tool just to start to as, uh, implement what they see as an Islamist caliphate. What, you know, what do the events in the Middle East, though, have to do with us here in the United States? How should we be looking at this? I mean, can this change our lives? Yeah, it can change our lives dramatically. I mean, we just, just a couple of weeks ago, we almost went to war with Syria, and that would have affected uh, us dramatically. Economically, for one, who knows what's going to happen to the price of oil, it, it'll affect the price of gas. Who knows what's going to happen to the Suez Canal if that becomes a, a sort of a roadblock to the flow of oil to uh, Europe and the West, and, th and that could affect it. Also, it affects uh, American servicemen and women if they're going to be put into action or in harm's way. And so what happens here sort of ripples around the world and especially to the shores of the United States. And so we need to be uh, concerned about what's happening. One other thing, Lauren, is that I think uh, it's, and it's a biblical principle is uh, in Genesis 12, 1 and 2 that says, or 2 and 3, that says, he that blesses Israel will be blessed, he that curses Israel will be cursed. So I think it's a very important biblical principle for the United States to keep blessing uh, the, the mm -hmm. nation of Israel. Not to say that it, it's always uh, perfect, but it, it, there's a spiritual blessing to those yeah. that bless this country. But Chris, there are many people uh, around the world, and certainly um, you know, millions of people, who don't believe in biblical prophecy, who don't see what's happening in the Middle East as any sort of understanding, and, are, and actually are fearing how Christians view um, the kind of prophecies in the Bible saying, you know, those who you know, support Israel will be blessed and those who don't will not be blessed. This is a very political statement that you're saying, and that they fear right. this. And that the Bible really doesn't give prophecy. It simply is a narrative of redemption. And so to make these kind of statements about what the Bible actually means in terms of the political elements that are going on, that's a very dangerous thing to do. Right. No, I understand that. I, I, and there is uh, the fear that some people that believe in Bible prophecy will actually try to precipitate those events that uh, the Bible talks about. And that can be a dangerous thing. But, but I think one of the things I'd like to do, what I wanted to do in uh, Dateline Jerusalem, uh, Lauren, was sort of uh, lay out some of these trends that are happening that, uh, that I, I think actually people should be rejoicing about eventually. One of those trends is that the gospel that started here 2,000 years ago is sort of circumnavigating the world and it's eventually going to come back here to uh, the Mount of Olives, the sort of eternal finish, finish line. People are praying like never before for the peace of Jerusalem and people are praying for these unfolding of events. Um, I, I don't know how to allay the fears of certain people that uh, look at biblical prophecy in a, in a different way, but uh, it, it's a, 
if they, people want to understand the times, I think that mm -hmm. one, they have to have a biblical lens and a biblical foundation of what's happening. And uh, there's, a, there's a scripture in the, the First Chronicles that says, you know, the sons of Issachar understood the time.